Another mental cliche of journalism uh, of, this, of our period is dealing with the future. Very often I'm being asked uh, by, in interviews by journalists, what will happen? What do you think will happen? I'm sorry that I left my crystal ball somewhere, but I really don't know what will happen. I mean, it is, there are so many factors that might lead, and also I want to hope that, that it's not my worst uh, 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 forecast will be, will be uh, materialized, but uh, something much better. So I always say that I'm a very conservative journalist because I prefer to speak about what happened yesterday and what happens today, and not what about what will happen in the future. But this is indeed a curious, a curious development of, of uh, journalism, and it happens a lot in Israel. For example, you, f you read the headline uh, in the paper. Bush will tell, tomorrow the, will tell the Palestinians tomorrow that they should be good, good kids. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, if, you are, if you behave well, we'll give you money. So why do, you, why do we need tomorrow's paper if we already know tomorrow, today, what, what Bush will say tomorrow? So why do we need the meeting if we know what he's going to say? And sometimes it's even, it, even more ridiculous. Um, I guess this is, has to do partly because of uh, the competition that we have, that written media has with, uh, with TV and with the Internet. There is such an explosion of, of information and very often not very necessary information that the written media knows that by tomorrow it will be already outdated because of what is be being published by, uh, uh, being broadcast by radio or by TV. So they want to, to, to uh, go ahead what is going to be on TV instead of doing something else instead of using the written word as an opportunity to go deeper into things, into, to, to give a, a, a more details, because we know how TV is tired of details, shows some snapshots and some sentences and some uh, 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 slogans, and that's it. So take the opportunity and give some more information. Dig for some more information without cliches. Instead, we have written TV in some of the Israeli media, I guess, also here. Sometimes you think that you, you just see a TV broadcast written, printed on paper because it's very short headlines, very abrupt sentences, very short, very, uh, very economical with the information they give. Um, this, is, this educates people to mediocrity. Uh, and unfortunately, editors, because of the, the prices of papers and the prices of uh, uh, print and the competition, and the, they, they assume that people do not want more. So they actually feed this assumption into the reading uh, norms of new generations. And I think that, uh, I don't know how many of you know about the Ferrara conf uh, festival, journalism festival that Internationale organized a few weeks ago. And we were all surprised because there were so many young uh, people, I think around 2000, who came to listen to lengthy talks of journalists. Many of them spoke in, in, not in Italian. And they were so curious to get information in depth, not just the, the slogans. So the very assumption that, that the public does not want more, and that's why we have to compete with uh, TV or Internet of how shallow we can be, is uh, very dubious. Actually, when, you, when journalists and editors say that they think about, that they uh, give short information and uh, do not want to make it too heavy on the readers, they think about the readers instead of thinking about the subject they write about. But we don't know who the readers are, but we do know what the subject is and who is the, 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 the subject or the object of our writing. 
because this is what we investigated, this is what we studied, this is what we, we are dealing with. So what we do if we sh cut short everything, we do not do justice to the subject that we are writing about, and very often we, deal, we, de we, we talk about human beings and about people's lives, and we uh, look down at, the, at this imagined reader and uh, assume that this imagined reader is really, really the, very shallow. But I want to stress that this attitude, that these mental cliches and these socialized attitudes always serve power. Always uh, because people are surrounded with the official version, official versions of the reality. So if you don't give an alternative, you don't give alternative information, you don't give extra information to what the official version, to, to, to the way that the official version is being bombarded at us from all directions, then you serve power. Um, you, don't serve, you don't serve the democratic rule of freedom of choice. You don't offer the people the freedom of choice of facts from which you can deduct your conclusions about the reality and about events. Another cliché, of course, is to claim that journalists are and should be objective. This is a famous cliché. Um, no one, no journalist can be neutral to the subject or to the object of, the, of his or her writing. There is, we always have a certain angle that is determined by our life, by our gender, by our uh, economical situation, by our history, everything. By the, the way, by the mood that we woke up in the morning. Um, there is always, everybody has a, a, a world view. And even those who say that they don't have a world view, and I've encountered some, it means that they, they describe, they, their world view is, is what is the world view of power. Very often you see you experience that, I mean, it's true about uh, American press that I know a little bit and the Israeli press. When somebody claims, when somebody is considered objective, is someone who actually voices the official version about occupation, about military, uh, Israeli military operations, etc. I'll give you an example. I was known from the beginning uh, of the 90s that I was very suspicious of the Oslo process. And some of my colleagues um, accused me of being ideological because I'm against the Oslo process. But they, they were in favor of the Oslo process, so they, so they are not ideological. They are objective. I am the one who is not objective. But because they support an official, the official uh, 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 policy, of the Oslo process, then they are objective. On the contrary, when we know that we cannot be objective, we are much more careful to be fair in the way we present the, the facts. Because we are, much more, we are much more conscious of those who might say, oh, you are not objective. So we bring other facts, other voices, even those that we don't, uh, we don't uh, like. Let me give you a recent example. I was investigating for some weeks now, and I wrote about it, um, the phenomenon of pirate dumping sites of garbage in the occupied territories, in the West Bank. Um, people called me from several villages, Palestinian villages, that there is a phenomenon of Israeli truck drivers who bring, 
who bring garbage and, uh, and mostly all sorts of garbage and, uh, and uh, disposal from Israel into private land of some of Palestinians who get money for this. Now, the Israeli truck drivers and the Israeli contractors who uh, bring these uh, this, uh, uh, leftovers mostly of, of uh, construction sites, they save a lot of money by not going to official dumping sites which charge money. The Palestinian owners of land uh, get money for this. But of course, the whole, the whole, the, the villages and the, the valleys and the uh, surrounding are being hurt and uh, by, by this influx of uh, not Palestinian uh, disposal and uh, solid waste. And uh, by the noise, I'll give you an example. In one of the villages, this with I, Na'ilin, the village itself, the the the. Every, twice a week, they dispose of their uh, waste. It's about 10 to, 10 to 8, 8 to 10 uh, tons every day of solid waste. The dumping site, this illegal dumping site in their village, has, uh, there are about 50 or 60 trucks which come every day, every day, six days per week, and each of them has 20 tons. Each of them dumps 20 tons of uh, solid waste, Israeli solid waste. There is already a mountain in one of the places, there is already a mountain of solid waste. The roads of the village cannot carry so much, uh, so many trucks every day. They are being, uh, the main maintenance is very, very difficult. On the other hand, you have some this, let me say, these illegal dumping sites are in an in a area which is under total Israeli, full Israeli control, administrative and uh, military control. It's what's called Area C of the West Bank. It's 60% of the West Bank, 60% of the West Bank, which means that it is the Palestinian Authority cannot send its officials or its uh, uniformed officials to impose the law. The law there is strictly Israeli. There are Israeli authorities that should enforce the law. They know it's illegal. It's illegal to open those dumping sites, and it's illegal for those Israeli truck drivers to dispose of the solid waste. They do nothing. Maybe they confiscated during the last uh, half year a few trucks but they did not close those dumping sites. At the same time, Palestinian villages had to open their own uh, uh, sites, of dumping sites, uh, because of the, all the system of roadblocks and checkpoints made it impossible for them to reach a central dumping site, which is anyway flowing, uh, uh, overflowing uh, in Ramallah, and they had to open in near their villages, and they looked for some sites which are far from the village, in a land which is uh, owned by the village. And some of the villagers united and, and brought some money to open an, uh, an, in order, an orderly dumping site where they would also eventually separate the, the, the forms of uh, plastic, away from organic, etc. This is also in an area which is under Israeli control, Area C. And this Area C is what Israel is aiming at confiscating, eventually, at expropriating for the future uh, agreement, so-called, of two states. Now, these dumping sites were shut down by Israel, by the Israeli military authorities. Dumping sites which are for the Palestinians, on Palestinian land, on Palestinian uh, 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 own land, not, it's not even public uh, land. So I wrote about it. Now, 
I admit, from the start, I knew who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. No, I don't hide it. The military is always the bad guys, no doubt. But here I have to also to describe the nuances. You have the Palestinians who, who collaborate with the Israeli truck drivers and open this, give their land for these dumping sites. I'm not, I will not cover up for them just because they are Palestinians, of course not. Then um, you have the Palestinian Authority, and you might know that I'm not... Uh, I don't, I don't uh, reserve my criticism from the Palestinian Authority. Some people complain that the Palestinian Authority could have done more in order to close down those dumping sites, maybe by arresting the... Uh, or having some measures against the owners of the land. It's true, one of them, for example, was arrested for one week, and a file was... Uh, a complaint was filed in, in Palestinian court against him, but it's stuck somewhere. Does he pay money to someone? Or what? I have no idea. It was, it was impossible to, to find out. But here, I must say, I listen to the people complaining about the Palestinian Authority, and as I told you, I'm not, I, I'm not, I, I'm not shy at criticizing the Palestinian Authority, but here I found that it doesn't, they really are helpless vis-à-vis -vis this phenomenon, because this area is totally Israeli, under Israel control. So this was an example of com something seemingly unpolitical, where it's clear to me who, who is bad, who is, who is wrong here, or who is deliberately wrong. And this is, by rule, the military occupation. I mean, I have... Blindly, I will tell you that in every case that I investigate in the occupied territories, uh, uh, there are int the intentions of the military authorities are always against the, the people. I have no doubt about it. But that, it doesn't mean that I'm not checking thoroughly to see. At the beginning, when I just started writing, I did not know about the dumping sites which were shut down by the military. So I only knew about the dumping sites, the illegal dumping sites, which went undisturbed. While investigating, I understood that this comparison strengthening is, strengthens my point. Here, I'm, I'm actually referring to another cliché that I consciously avoid always when I write. Uh, there is no balance. We, when we cover, especially when we cover such issues as occupation, as uh, salaries, conditions of work, conditions of labor, gender relations, don't don't feel obliged to balance. We are not, as Robert Fisk, I will now quote him, as Robert Fisk says, we are not in a football match, and we are the referee that has to, to decide between two, uh, two, uh, two groups. Two, uh, yeah, two groups. When there is rape, I often answer to people who, who complain that I'm not objective. When there is rape, if you report about rape, will you bring the position of the rapist? Will you bring the, the explanation why the rapist raped? He had bad life, he, had bad, uh, he's, he's, he was an abused child or what so. I will bring information, but I will not bring it in an, in an empathic way, um, empathetic way and sympathetic way. The same I say about South Africa and, and, and the Soviet Union. Uh, did we expect uh, journalists in South Africa to not to have a stand about apartheid? Or people who covered the Soviet Union not to have a stand about the oppression there? Or when people write about China, are, do we expect people not to have a stand about this wild capitalism and, and destruction of... of uh, human lives, which doesn't mean that we, when we write news, we have to say what we think. As I said, 
what we think is expressed in the way of writing. On the contrary, I think it's better always to let the facts speak. Don't, don't add to the facts your own personal opinion, especially when it is not an opinion piece. The facts should always speak for themselves. This is, another this is an advice, another adva advice except of the cliché. Now, if I make a summary of my journalistic advice in this, in this uh, lesson. So, as I said, the first one, the very first one, is without stylistic clichés and without uh, lingual formulas and models. And this in order to train ourselves in choosing our own words in being precise in the way that we bring the information. Not something which is vague, which, which opens, which lets the reader guess some things, or which hides our lack of information, our own lack of information. Very often, a cliché hides this, is a camouflage for lack of knowledge. Another advice that I would always give to, to debut, debutants is always suspect the powerful. Always suspect those who are at the top. Always suspect leaders uh, of all sorts. Um, suspect, be suspicious of their motives. Be, susp be suspicious of the information they give you, of the information that they don't give you. The starting point has to be, they want to preserve their power, their privileges, their status. So they will use everything they can in order to... Uh, 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 also, they will use the, the press in order to preserve this power. As I said, they will use it in order to, to minimize the variety or to limit the variety of facts which allow people to make choices. To, to, to determine their opinion, not according to what they dictate, but free of their dictate, diktat. Also, I would advise us all to be suspicious of what's called news. We are so much obsessed by the new that we forget that we don't even know the, the old, the old that, that is behind the new. Again, I could give you an example from, from my area. Uh, I think that Italian press would, would uh, always write, or almost always write, and they report about an Israeli casualty, or about a Palestinian mortar, Kassam, as it's called, that is launched from the Gaza Strip. Not to, not to mention, of course, suicide attacks. But the, the very same media would not cover the old news, or those, what I said, the routine news. I guess, again, because I don't read Italian, I mean, no, I, I'm careful here, but I would guess that also here, uh, you know about an immigrant who attacked an Italian. Uh, but you wouldn't know, I mean, you wouldn't read in the press on a daily basis all examples of terrible abuse or terrible exploitation of immigrants who live here. And more than that... <laughs> more than that, the, this press which will write at length about how immigrants are harmful, does it deal with, 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 it does not deal with what is behind it, the globalization that means that capital has no limits of, uh, uh, of movement, enjoys freedom of movement, the capital, the money, and so are those who are uh, 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 owning the means and owning the, 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 the capital, holding the capital, while there is no freedom of movement to the masses. 
This, is, this immigration is a defiance of one of those globalization rules that capital determines who can move, what can move, what can enjoy freedom of movement and what cannot. So we all expect ourselves to enjoy the cheap clothes that are being sewn in India or China and people are not allowed to, to, to the capital and the goods have freedom of movement, the people who produce it do not have the freedom of movement. This is behind the phenomenon of immigration of, uh, that the West suffers so much from. That is, also when we choose the news, the way we choose the news is we have to be careful not to accommodate what power, not to accommodate to power, what power wants us to write about. We, when we look for the new news, this newest news, this, this dramatic news, we very often hide the dramatic olds that are behind this news and that are uh, so uh, 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 crucial in understanding the new news. <clears throat> Of course, I will not hide that, that behind this advice of mine, there is a certain, I would say, if not to sound too pompous, a journalistic uh, philosophy. Uh, not only journalistic. Part of being, or, or understanding of true democracy forces, uh, almost naturally leads us to, to, to uh, always aspire for a change and for the better. Always look for a change and uh, in everything we do in this society. I know it's, uh, it sounds uh, a lot, um, but this, I think this is the nature of, of radical democracy. Never, never be satisfied with, with what there is now. Never be satisfied with uh, electoral democracy where you go and choose, elect once in four, four, four years or so. Uh, put power, put representatives under permanent scrutiny, under permanent examination, under permanent criticism. Um, this is... This is a guiding line for me when I think about uh, my job as a journalist. But very often I have to be um, to, to admit or to, to uh, accept the reality that changing is not, uh, is not very easy because reporters do not change. Reporters reflect they, they can change only when it is in tandem with social movements outside the, 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 what, is being, what is being reported about in, in the society. And when there is no such movement in the society, journalists and media as part of the society do not have something to reflect and then to dialogue with in order to bring for a change. Um, but then I would say, and this will be my last advice to the journalists among you, at least if we cannot challenge power or change something, at least let us annoy power. This gives a lot of satisfaction, I must say, when we annoy power. <laughs>